Hello and welcome. My name is Ron Timahin. I'm a professional photographer, director and producer based in London. I've been specialising in cityscape, portraits and commercial photography for a number of years now and I've been very fortunate to work with some of my favourite brands including Apple, Adobe, Sony, Wex, Lacey and more. My work has been included in several publications including British Vogue, GQ, Digital Camera Magazine, Hypebeast and more. I'm also the co-founder of Aldox, an agency that creates compelling commercial work for brands such as EA Sports, while also making sure to give back to charity in some way. I published my first solo photography book entitled London Fog a couple of years ago. It was sold globally and it was also featured as one of the Times Photography Books of the Year in 2019. So that's me. Today, we're going to be looking at my process when it comes to shooting cityscape and landscape photography. We'll be looking at how I do my research online, location scouting tips, we'll also take a look at my kit bag and the tools that I use to capture cityscapes, also looking at the importance of backing up your work and your content even when you're on shoot, and lastly we'll go through my editing process so that you can see how I turn my raw imagery into what I envision. My location scouting normally starts with Google. I type in the city name and then photography locations and see what comes up. You will often find that people have already curated a list of photographic places within that city. So scroll through and note down which places you like. Once you have found a location that you are particularly fond of, you can then research further. I would then head on to Google Images and have a look at the images that have already been captured at that location. Here you can find sources of inspiration and you can also take note of the vantage points that people have captured their subjects from. One thing to note is that you don't want to completely copy somebody else's shot, so try and think about how you can add your artistic flair to that image. Once you are on Google Maps there are many different modes that can help you distinguish where you want to shoot from or how to get there. I like to go into satellite mode, that way you get a clear overview of the area that you are shooting. One of my favourite modes is Street View. Street View gives you the ability to jump into the city and have a 360 virtual tour. This way I can check if my location is publicly accessible or whether I need special permission to get to that point. The next thing to check is the weather. I like to capture my cityscape photos during golden hours or blue hours. For those that don't know, golden hour is an hour after sunrise and an hour before sunset. Blue hours are an hour before sunrise and an hour after sunset. The reason I like to shoot during these hours is that during golden hour you get a lovely consistent golden light which is very flattering for buildings. If you shoot during blue hour then you get this lovely moody effect and you also get the added benefit of having city lights on which can create some beautiful colours in your imagery. We're going to talk about gear and these are my everyday tools that I use to shoot cityscapes. First off is the body, obviously. Um, I like to run around with the Alpha 7C. As you can see it's really small but it's also full frame and really powerful and so it keeps my kit bag light, which I love. On the body right now, I have the 40mm f2.5 lens, and it's one of Sony's latest lenses and also one of their most compact lenses. I also run around with the Sony 24mm f2.8, and I absolutely love this lens. It's part of the same compact series as the 40mm, and as you can see, it's really small. So although I have a 24mm f1.4, this gives me more flexibility when I'm running around a city. I also have another prime lens, which is the 35mm f1.4. Uh, I absolutely love this lens. This is my go-to lens for most things when it comes to cityscape, portraiture, landscape. Uh, it's a very, very versatile lens. And if I could run around with just one lens, it would be this lens right here. Now, another of my favourite lenses is the 16 to 35 f2.8. I've had this lens for a very long time and I find it one of the most fun lenses to use when shooting cityscapes. 
Again, it has such versatility. You can shoot really wide, but you can also zoom in and shoot at 35 millimeter if you want to shoot portraits. Um, yeah, very, very fun lens just to walk around the city with. So I recommend everyone have this in the arsenal. And lastly, uh, 70 to 200. Now you might be thinking that's a strange one to have for cityscape photography, but over the years I've learned that this lens gives beautiful compression and it can make buildings look a lot closer together than they actually are. And so for that reason and that reason only, I love this lens. Of course, it's quite heavy and big, but I think it's a special lens that can be used in very interesting ways. So that's bodies and lenses done. Now I'm gonna talk about the accessories that I like to carry with me every day. Something that I often carry around with me is a tripod. Now a tripod is something that I think all photographers should own. They come in very, very handy. Uh, their sole purpose is to keep your camera as stable as possible. And so when it comes to shooting cityscapes, I use this in low light situations. This means that I can shoot at a longer shutter speed, which means that my ISO can stay low, meaning that I have cleaner, less noisy images. Something else that I carry, which is really small, but really useful are lens wipes. Lens wipes are really important. Um, I love these ones by Zeiss. I carry them everywhere. Um, you can get big packs of 200 for very, very cheap and um, they keep your lenses clean, which is very important. You don't want any finger marks or dust or anything on your lenses. Um, lens wipes, definitely have those. Another accessory I like to play around with are filters. And filters can give you really interesting results as well. Um, I use filters by Tiffin. There are other brands out there, but for me, Tiffin are the best. And um, for example, this one in particular is an ND filter that I can put on my 35 millimeter lens. And what that does is it darkens um, the exposure that goes into your camera, which means that you can shoot at slower shutter speeds during the day, which can create some really interesting effects like water being completely smooth. So filters are also um, good accessories to have in your toolkit. And so there you have it. That's what's in my bag. I normally like to switch it up, but those are my go-to lenses and my go-to equipment that I shoot regularly with. Um, of course, when you're shooting different subjects, switch it up, experiment, have fun. But I find these tools work really, really well for me. Back in 2015, I unfortunately suffered from hard drive failure. It's one of those things that until it happens to you, you don't take it seriously. But what I really want to get across to you guys is back up your work properly. There is nothing like the feeling of losing thousands of images and actually memories that you can never get back. Now my backing up process is a lot more streamlined and a lot more secure and I would like to talk to you guys a little bit today about how I do that whilst I'm on shoot or whilst I'm traveling. After a day of shooting, I will back up my content immediately. Sometimes this even means backing up whilst I'm still on location. Anything can happen from the time you are on location to the time you get home. So doing it immediately is a massive weight off my shoulders. So, how do you back up whilst you're on the move without bringing your heavy laptop, your chargers, your cables, your adapters? I have found that the Lacey Rugged Boss SSD is an amazing tool to help you do this. What makes this device really great is that you don't need a computer or a laptop to make it work. This particular hard drive is battery powered, which means that you can directly upload all of your files straight into the Lacey itself. It's really simple to use and really intuitive. As you can see, it has an SD card port, which is perfect for mirrorless and DSLR cameras. It also has a USB-C port, and this is where you can use your hard drive as a normal hard drive by plugging it into a computer. There is also a USB type A port, and at the end here, you can see the charging port. This cable you can see here is interchangeable and it can connect to different devices. What I have on it now is the Lacey to Lightning cable. And this means that I can plug the Lacey into my mobile phone and review my files on my mobile device using the Lacey app.
One of the settings that I really love is that when you put your SD card in for the second time, it automatically detects what has been uploaded previously. Therefore, it won't copy all of the files that are on your SD card, it will copy just the new ones that have been captured since the last import. As an FYI for everyone watching, the majority of this edit will be done using Adobe Photoshop 2021. So this is the raw photo that came out of my camera. You can open and convert your raw file using any raw converter, such as Adobe Camera Raw, Adobe Lightroom, or Capture One. I did a few tweaks to it before I imported it into Photoshop, mainly changes to exposure, white balance, and composition. I also made some changes to the highlights just to retain some detail in the sky and I also boosted the shadows ever so slightly to bring back some of the detail in the shadows. The first thing I do when working in Photoshop is to duplicate the background layer. A shortcut for this on Mac is Command J, a shortcut for this on Windows is Control J. The image is looking quite flat so the first thing I'll do is add some global contrast using a curves adjustment layer. I can create some contrast in this image by creating an S curve by darkening the shadows and boosting the highlights. However, as you can see, it also boosts the saturation ever so slightly, and I don't want that. So to maintain complete control of our contrast, we're going to change the blend mode from normal to luminosity. This then means that the tone curve is only going to adjust the luminosity values of the pixels. It's not going to affect any color. I can now adjust the tone curve into the style that I like, and as you can see, it's not adjusting any of the saturation values, only the luminance values. Now we're going to adjust the color in the image. And again, we're going to do this by creating a curves adjustment layer. However, this time we want to affect the color, but we don't want to affect the luminosity values. So we're going to change the blend mode from normal to color. Color grading using the tone curve gives you the greatest level of flexibility and control. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to skip through it, but if you would like to see me do a tutorial on how to use the tone curve in detail, then let me know in the comments. The key to good editing is to make very subtle changes and build up your edits in increments. The next tool I'm going to be using on this photo is called Selective Color. Selective Color is a kind of overlooked tool but it's also really powerful. I'll change the blend mode from normal to color as I only want to affect the color again. The reason it's so powerful is that you're able to adjust how much color is present within another color. So for example, you can adjust how much yellow or cyan is within the color red. Similarly, you can adjust how much blue or cyan is within black. You can also do the same for whites and neutrals, which can give your photo a very distinct look. To use this tool to its full potential, I highly recommend that you research color science. Color science will help you understand the relation between colors and their opposites. Good practice within Photoshop is to rename and group your layers so that when you come back to doing adjustments later down the line, you can clearly see which adjustments are affecting what on the image. I also like to dodge and burn my images to shape the light a little bit better. I do this by creating luminosity masks so I can affect the shadows, midtones, and highlights individually. Again, if you would like to see a deeper tutorial on how to do this, then let me know in the comments. I'm now going to merge all of the layers together and create a new layer from that. The shortcut to do this on Mac is Shift Command Option E. The shortcut to do this on Windows is Shift Control Alt E. Now we're going to clean up the image and remove any distractions. We can do this by using something called Content Aware Fill. The first thing you'll want to do is select the lasso tool. You'll then want the feather to be at zero pixels. Draw around the object you would like to remove. In this instance, it's the seagull. Head up to Edit. Head down to Fill. Make sure that in Content, Content Aware is selected. The mode is normal and the opacity is 100%. Click OK and it's done. Using the content aware fill technique is really simple but also really powerful. I highly recommend everyone to use it on their photos. A lot of people ask me how I get my images so clean and this is one of the techniques that helps me do so. 
I also like to use the clone and stamp tool to heal any areas that are a little bit more tricky. And as you can see, a little bit of cleaning up goes a long way. To manipulate your colours even further, you can use a hue saturation adjustment layer. I find that Lightroom or Capture Run has really good scope for working with colours like this. And so often I will export the file again as a TIFF file, put it back into one of those programs and play with the colours there. Thank you for watching. If you have any more questions, then make sure to hit me up at Ron Timmerhin on Instagram.